So I <clears throat> thank the organizers for the uh, opportunity to talk, and I'll be talking about uh, it, almost entirely uh, two papers and uh, work joint with uh, two then uh, master's students at Stony Brook, uh, Yidi Chi and Subramani and Lakshman Narasimhan. Now, Yidi's uh, now a graduate student at uh, Northeastern. I think he's in the uh, audience. So, okay, so I'm going to give some introduction and uh, survey of uh, the previous work in this area. I'm not going to uh, give a lot of background about uh, Taylor geometry and the uh, problem, you know, the, the, the mathematical problems that we're solving. I'm going to assume you know something about that, but I will talk about uh, all of uh, the adaptations and uh, computational and uh, statistical aspects of it. So it's a you know very uh, you know in fact obviously one of the founding problems of uh, string compactification. The first uh, manifolds that were shown to be uh, viable as candidates for the extra dimensions of string theory were these uh, Ritchie flat uh, Kähler metrics shown to exist by uh, STEM. And so there's been a fair amount of work, largely by uh, physicists over the years, and trying to uh, understand both uh, analytically and numerically. So there was a uh, phase of uh, maybe uh, 20 or 30 papers in the uh, mid 2000s that I'll briefly review. And uh, the computers at that time to make a long story short were good enough. You know, again, we're talking about cheap computers like a, a laptop you know, good enough to uh, get results for very symmetric metrics, but uh, not for general metrics. And uh, one of the uh, main points of this talk is that uh, just the advances that were developed for machine learning, so GPUs, uh, software to uh, efficiently use them, and really the machine learning software makes it, this, these methods very uh, practical and, and, and feasible to calculate uh, metrics and uh, you know, six, seven dimensional manifolds with uh, little or no uh, symmetry. And so this really start, can start to be a, a general purpose tool for uh, differential geometers and uh, others who are interested in uh, these problems. Okay, so, uh, so this talk is oriented towards more mathematical audience in the sense of uh, <clears throat> notation and choice of uh, topics and uh, our code is uh, publicly available on GitHub. I've cited, I think, not all, but most of the uh, parallel and uh, subsequent works, and in particular, this uh, relatively you know, work from May of uh, Lars for, Lars for Segdal extended these methods. So they also have a, a publicly available software package, and uh, so uh, our software directly handles uh, hypersurface and projective space. And it wouldn't be that hard to generalize, but their work already has generalized it to a complete intersection and to our hypersurface. Okay, so very brief uh, review here. So we're in this talk going to talk about the uh, quintic hypersurface in uh, CP4 defined by uh, one quintic equation. And of course, uh, we can take a pretty general quantic, of course, not totally general. There's a condition for the manifold to be, uh, you know, non-singular, but uh, you know, very general. And uh, so, counting parameters minus uh, symmetries, this has 101 complex uh, moduli. And uh, the most uh, studied case is this uh, dwarf family, where you take the uh, Fermat quantic and you have a one parameter deformation. And uh, this pre pre preserves uh, the uh, basically maximal discrete symmetry that you could uh, preserve. So uh, what's a Calabi? Yeah, well, yeah, again, I'm, I'm hoping the audience basically knows, but a very uh, concise definition of this is that uh, there are two natural volume forms given that there is a zero first uh, term class. Of course, it's a Kähler manifold, so there's a, a Kähler volume form. And there's a, a second volume form, which is uh, basically the uh, square of the uh, unique uh, holomorphic end form, unique up to a uh, normalization. And uh, then this uh, 
volume of the first form is you know topological so you can set that normalization from the uh, start I'll, I'll remind the formula but this is a the disorder again form only depends on the uh, complex structure so if you set the normalization you can set the make the condition that these two volume forms were equal or equivalent with the duration is constant and you can show that that is equivalent to uh, Ricci's flat notes so that'll be our working definition and uh, you know despite uh, some efforts there is really no evidence that there is a uh, closed form or useful analytical expression for these uh, th these metrics so there, there, there's very interesting work about uh, k3 that i cite here and if it could be done for k3 it certainly would be worth looking into uh, the uh, three complex dimensional case but uh, not having that you either have uh, existence proof or you might have a uh, numerical method for approximating the metric. Or of course, you might have uh, both. You might uh, take your numerical metric and uh, try to prove that it approximates the, the real metric. So we're, you know, how can we do this? Well, you know, if we if we look around in the literature, of course, there's a you know, vast, vast literature of uh, numerical methods for uh, PDE. And uh, that could be a talk in itself. And, and, and in some sense, what we're going to do is a, a spectral method, meaning that uh, we're not describing the uh, metric, the uh, Kähler, you know, the, the Kähler potential in this case, in terms of uh, its values at points or in terms of uh, localized functions, we're going to describe them as an expansion and uh, polynomials or more generally, you know, sections of a, a holomorphic uh, line bundle. So. One can compare with uh, you know, the many spectral methods that, that use non-local basis, especially you know, Fourier space methods, and this will have some similarities with uh, that. Okay, so to give the uh, very brief uh, review, uh, this field was essentially started by physicists uh, Matt Hedrick, uh, Toby uh, Wiseman, who looked at the case of the uh, Kummer surface, the uh, K3, and uh, that has a uh, nice construction that, that most of you probably know, where you take a uh, orbifold T4 mod Z2, excise the singularities, and glue, glue in this uh, known Ricci flat non compact space called the Gucci Hansen. And uh, then that's a, a starting point, and then you can try to uh, perturb that combination of uh, metrics and impose the uh, you know, overlap between these essentially two types of uh, patches. And uh, that works, but uh, the local method they use is going to suffer from this uh, curse of dimensionality, which is, it, it, on some level all methods suffer from, but uh, is the main thing or the first thing that you're fighting in terms of trying to get an accurate result in uh, these high dimensions. And, and recall, you know, people that simulate uh, Navier Stokes, you know, for fluids, you know, that's effectively, uh, you know, three-dimensional time dependence, you could call four-dimensional, and uh, they use uh, supercomputers. So, so already that uh, is considered a high dimension in the uh, numerical literature, and so six is, would be an ultra-high dimension. Okay, so the uh, methods that we'll use really trace back to work of uh, Simon Donaldson, which was inspired by that. And uh, so his uh, starting point was to you know, grant that we've embedded the metric and not necessarily take the uh, initial defining embedding in, in, in CP4 in the case of hand, but uh, some embedding by sections of an ample line bundle. And uh, so we naturally get a family of embeddings of uh, whatever space, you know, complex space we have into a family of projective spaces. And uh, then we can vary the uh, Fubini Studi metric on these uh, embedding spaces and uh, by pulling back get a family of metrics which one can then show can arbitrarily well approximate the metric of interest on M. And of course that idea is not particular to uh, algebraic geometry and, and line bundles and so forth. One could imagine even embedding a uh, real manifold in some high dimensional Euclidean space and by the Nash theorem you know one could arbitrarily well approximate uh, that metric. That's not a much used method because the embedding is 
really relatively uncontrolled and arbitrary in that case, and uh, as such is uh, very likely to develop uh, singularities and other bad behavior not related to the original problem. But uh, in, the, in, in, in this case, it, it really works uh, much better. And I think there's more to say mathematically about uh, why that's the case. Maybe it's already been said. But many you know, the, 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 the simplest statement is just that there really are these uh, canonical embeddings that, uh, in, again, to be concrete in the case at hand, uh, we take a uh, you know, O of K over CP4 to the degree K line bundle. We take a, a basis of section as those sit inside, of course, you know, K, degree K homogeneous uh, polynomials in the uh, projective uh, coordinates, the homogeneous coordinates. And uh, then we can write a general onsatz for this uh, pullback of the uh, Fubini's 2D metric, which depends on a uh, permission matrix, which I've done it denoted little h in this equation. So uh, if we had just taken the um, defining embedding in the CP4, then this would be a, a five by five permission matrix with 25 real parameters. But if we take higher and higher uh, degree line models, of course, we can get arbitrarily high dimension, uh, you know, you know, H, you know B, H zero and, uh, you know, dimension of the embedding space and uh, dimension of this uh, matrix, which is parameterizing the uh, metric. And uh, as you would expect on, you know, very general grounds, if you work out carefully the asymptotics of this, the uh, number of parameters grows as the uh, degree of the uh, line bundle raised to the real dimension of the space. So you certainly have enough parameters to uh, approximate to arbitrary precision. And you can, of course, show that, uh, that that's the case. And uh, so the, uh, the use of the sections of the line bundle make this uh, canonical. You know, there just is you know, a space of sections. The onsat stack given here is basis independent because uh, you know, clearly we, we, we've uh, chosen the general bilinear form or sesquilinear form on this uh, basis. And uh, so that's one reason it should be better behaved. Okay, so, so that's a way of approximating general metrics, which is relatively natural. Again, it's still you know, basically expanding you know, e to the Kähler potential on a polynomial basis, but it's, it's giving a generalization and some rationale for that. Now, the, the other interesting, really in some ways more interesting aspect of, 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 of that paper of Donaldson was to uh, replace the problem of finding a Ritchie flat metric with what's called the uh, balanced metric, which is a, a term that has more than one <clears throat> use. But in this particular case, what it basically means is that the uh, inner product on the space of sections defined by, so, so if you look at this integral formula, basically what we're doing is we're taking the associated metric on the uh, line bundle and we're using it and uh, then the, you know, some volume form to take the, to define another inner product on the uh, basis of uh, sections. And uh, so we're asking that that, Base, uh, that that inner product, <clears throat> you know, global over the manifold aligns is essentially you know equal, and, and you know because of the, the covariance of the expression is, is as a matrix is the inverse, but it's the same inner product that we use to define the uh, embedding and the metric on the line bundle, and uh, so that's a natural condition, and uh, it even has uh, some sort of uh, physical interest in the sense that uh, you can relate these problems to the uh, quantum Hall effect in higher dimensions. And that this is the statement that the uh, density of states function is uh, constant. So it was work I did with uh, Semyon Klevsov quite a while ago developing this. Okay, and, and then there is a expansion for that uh, density of uh, states. That's the uh, you know, physics term, but the, the math term is just the, uh, you know, the local norm of the uh, sum over uh, sections. And uh, so in this uh, balanced metric, that's by definition uh, constant, but uh, <clears throat> more generally, it, there's a expansion in terms of the uh, underlying metric on the line bundle and then the uh, you know, associated you know, Kähler potential and metric, which expands 
as this power series in geometric invariance going from that metric. So the leading correction is going to be the uh, Ricci scalar, and then you get uh, higher and higher powers, and it's an asymptotic expansion in the uh, degree, or you know, real, more, more precisely, the number of uh, sections of the line bundle. And uh, so using that, Tianyao's Zeldish expansion, you can show that uh, the, the balance matrix as the degree goes to infinity converges, in fact, to the constant Ricci scalar, and in this case, Ricci flag metric. So that's an alternate way to uh, formulate the problem, which asymptotically turns into the same problem. Okay, so, so then for certainly our computational use, and more generally, it's nice to have some sort of a energy functional that you can vary to get these uh, conditions. And there's a nice energy functional for the uh, balanced matrix, which uh, involves the uh, volume form and uh, the uh, determinant of this matrix matrix uh, H that we've introduced. And in fact, uh, you know, this is this is very important partly because it's a uh, moment map, it turns out, of the uh, you know, UN you know, action on this uh, embedding. And uh, the uh, and as such it's a, a convex functional of this uh, matrix H defining <clears throat> the embedding and the Kähler potential. And so for that reason you can you can prove uh, you know, convergence of you know existence, or do you, you know in, in generality you can prove that the existence of a minimum is governed by a stability, and then that led to a <clears throat> Donaldson uh, song and else you know later work on uh, metrics on uh, you know positive curvature manifolds related to stability. Okay, so uh, so because of that convexity, there's a very many simple ways of solving this. And one that Donaldson used was an iterative scheme where you just uh, compute this matrix of inner products, invert it, and then use that as your new embedding and just uh, iterate this uh, scheme. And so that makes the uh, programming conceptually straightforward. You, know, you have a guaranteed uh, convergent uh, scheme, but it's kind of expensive to actually compute all these intervals. Okay, so, so that... Uh, was very influential work. Uh, you know, we wrote some papers using that. We were able to, uh, he, you know, Donald sort of does this on K3, and then we did it for the uh, Quintic uh, Calabial. One can adapt it to uh, Hermitian Yang Mills equations. Uh, this is an example of uh, restricting the uh, Ricci, the, the balance metric to a, a particular curve in the Fermat Quintic as a function of the degree going up from one to like uh, 15 or something like that from our work. And this both shows you that it, it, it is converging, but it's converging very slowly. And the basic reason for that is that the uh, balance metric is asymptotic, but the corrections are in powers of one over the degree. And the leading correction goes with one over degree squared. So that, that's, that's you know, a pretty big correction. You have to go to a very large degree to get an accurate Ricci flat metric. And if what you really want is a Ricci flat metric, it's better to just pick a different uh, loss function, such as uh, Ricci flatness. Or in the case of hand, we had this uh, eta quantity, recall the, the ratio of the uh, two volume forms, which was uh, one for a properly normalized vol you know, volume form in Ricci flat. So you could take as a loss function the norm of uh, eta minus uh, one. And uh, that turns out also to be convex, at least in the uh, continuum limit, in the limit that you were doing this for the uh, whole <clears throat> metric with all of its uh, degrees of freedom. And then mathematically, it's, 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 it's not as nice because uh, you, you know, the, the, the balanced guy was a convex even for the uh, finite problem. And this one in general is not, but uh, numerically it's definitely pretty good. And uh, Hedrick and Nassar proposed and uh, used Use this to get uh, you know very accurate uh, Ricci flat metrics on uh, K three. Okay, so uh, so if you wanted to show you know how, how good this was, again, it's, it, it, it shares the properties of these uh, spectral or polynomial expansions. You know, we know from the uh, Yao theorem that we're looking for a uh, C infinity metric, and uh, so the coefficients in uh, this uh, spectral basis are going to fall off uh, exponentially. And so the accuracy should be exponential in the uh, degree. Yeah, but there's another issue once you have that type of a general result, which is that it's possible that the metric you're interested in has what 
you know, physics uh, supply and efficient recall structure on many scales. And I'll, I'll, I'll give examples of that. But one of the basic examples is to say that uh, the, uh, the, you know, these manifolds, cloud VR three folds, all have, well, except well, yeah, they, they all have, uh, you know, homology in uh, three dimensions, you know, and you know, be, you know, bet, third Betty number. And uh, then uh, you can, by tuning uh, complex structure, make a uh, three cycle shrink to become arbitrarily small. And in fact, you approach a, a double point a singularity to define an equation. And uh, then you can use a approximate, you know, you, you know a, it's the, the solution for the Ritchie flat metric on the, this non-compact region of this singularity is called conical and that's known. And so you can look at that and see that, well, yes, the metric is going to develop a mild parallax singularity in that limit. And so the uh, derivative of the uh, you know, the metric, the Kähler potential, whatever is going to, uh, you know, grow there. And so you need some structure, some sort of basis, which is high enough order to represent uh, that small cycle. And so that's another constraint on the uh, degree. And then that's a kind of a hard constraint to uh, take into account computationally, because basically the proper representation of this nearly, you know, this nearly singular behavior, like this small three cycle requires the degree to be big, but then if you take the full basis of uh, sections of polynomials, you'll get that degree raised to the sixth power, and that just again explodes. You can't really put that on a computer for you know k much bigger than ten. And uh, so, uh, so this was kind of the state of things for this work. It either you know you needed symmetry, you needed to stay away from these uh, singular limits. Okay, so again, you know, fairly well known problem. And uh, a very basic problem in the machine learning that we're, you know, what are we doing there? You know, we're doing things like, uh, you know, have we have a, a list of uh, labeled images, you know, this image is a cat, this image is a dog, you know, can the computer learn to distinguish the, or, you know, classify into the, you know, different labels. And uh, so the input here is a, you know, many million dimensional space, you know, the pixels of, uh, each uh, image and you know, perhaps with uh, three colors and so forth. So this uh, cursive dimensionality a priori is a, a central aspect of machine learning. And so it's you know, obvious you know, that this is a place where one could look to try to uh, find methods to, to deal with this. And uh, so what's the most famous and most broadly effective of these methods? It's the uh, neural uh, feed forward network. So, you know, again, you know, you know many of you will, will know this, but uh, just to very concisely review it, we're defining a uh, map between vector spaces in this case, but it's a nonlinear map, but it's a very controlled type of uh, nonlinearity. We're going to produce it by composing linear maps, which I've called, uh, you know, denoted a W here. And these are each independent uh, linear maps, you know, concretely they can be represented by matrices given, you know, given the choice of basis and some fixed nonlinear map, uh, which I've called a beta here. So we have a, you know, say a D dimensional input. We map that into some N dimensional vector space by a linear map W1. And then we apply some nonlinear function just in, independently to each component of the uh, vector and again some explicit basis and that's the nonlinear you know we just iterate this some definite number of times where the number is called the depth of the network and uh, so it's you know clearly nonlinear it clearly has lots of parameters and if these things are sufficiently generic you should be able to approximate the generic function using them so uh, the uh, theta, again, there's not that much constraint on what you can use. And in, 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 in practical computer implementations, what one often uses is this very simple function called a ReLU, which is just uh, if, x, if the, you know, the input x is positive, it's x. If the input x is uh, negative, it's uh, 0. So it's about as uh, minimal a nonlinearity as you could postulate, and then you can prove that even with that nonlinearity, by uh, even taking just two layers, but a sufficiently large dimension of this uh, intermediate or uh, you know hidden space, 
you can arbitrarily well approximate any function on that space. So it's very powerful and simple construction. So this was uh, shown in 1989. And uh, then the result there is that you typically need a number of intermediate an intermediate dimension, which is exponentially large and you know, any of the parameters of the problem. And so in terms of this person dimension, how you gained uh, nothing, you know, as a, you could have just taken a, uh, you know, you know, a polynomial or, you know, some other simple minded basis, but by using more than two layers, it turns out that you gain quite a bit. And there, there's some literature on this. For example, if you have a, a radially symmetric function, you can find functions that are, uh, you need an exponentially large hidden dimension for the two layer network, but you can do it with a relatively small intermediate dimension for a party for a three layer network. And so it's clear that the depth allows the network to be more expressive with uh, fewer parameters. And uh, this was uh, some of the better papers on this question as of uh, uh, you know 20, uh, well, this, this, this is 2020. And uh, you know, the work continues. I'm, I'm not sure that people have a strong theorem of describing this phenomenon, but uh, it's, it's an interesting and, and relatively well-defined question. Okay, so, so how are we going to use that? Well, the uh, definition of our problem suggested that uh, you know, the sections of the line was in terms of you know, embedding by sections of a line bundle, those are you know, in concrete terms, polynomials. So those should play a distinguished role. And uh, in concrete terms, what we could say is, let's take uh, this expression where the S's are sections, you know, more concretely hom homogeneous polynomials of some degree, and replace the uh, list, the basis of uh, sections with the output of a feedforward network where the nonlinearity was chosen to also produce homogeneous polynomials of, of that degree. And that's very easy to do because if the uh, two maps, the linear map clearly preserves homogeneity. So if the nonlinear map preserves homogeneity, then we'll get, if we feed in say the homogeneous coordinates, we'll get uh, homogeneous uh, polynomials as the output. And so, uh, you know, obviously the simplest choice we can make is just the, the quadratic function squaring what comes in as our nonlinearity. And uh, in, Again, more general, you know, real, you know, approximating real functions. This 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 guy is actually sometimes considered a little problematic, but here it, it's a very good choice because uh, it's a, you're directly realizing the mathematical constraint that uh, you know that, that we have. Okay, so <clears throat> so this idea of taking a list, you know, taking the original expression and replacing each. Uh, holomorphic section with the output of a neural network. We call it holomorphic network in our work. And uh, by using a quadratic map for each of these theta, clearly we get a power of two <clears throat> as the degree. So we can rapidly get very high degree polynomials that way. Uh, now it turned out for, for reasons which are not that hard to uh, understand that uh, a better choice in this case was not to replace each of the uh, sections with a network, but to first evaluate basically, uh, you know, real or, you know, sesquilinear quantities, take uh, products of the homogeneous coordinates Z with their complex conjugates as Z bar. And so we could call that a uh, bi-homogeneous polynomial of degree one comma one. And then if we take those as the inputs, we can still use the uh, quadratic, uh, activation function and nonlinearity and get out uh, pi homogeneous polynomials of degree two to the L comma two to the L and uh, then just take the logarithm of that as our uh, scalar potential. And uh, so you, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to spend a lot of time on why that's uh, better. I mean, the, the most simple thing to check is just that uh, even to get the non-degenerate Fubini stereometric out uh, of the holomorphic network, you need a very large uh, number of uh, sections. And so you need a very large number of intermediate coefficients. Whereas if you try to do that with the bi-homogeneous network, you can just uh, take uh, a given bi-homogeneous network and then 
run it through another one-dimensional layer where you apply the quadratic nonlinearity. You can do that as many times as you want. So you can essentially for free increase the uh, degree. You can add additional functions of this uh, arbitrary power of two degree and get structure which is localized however you want. So, you know, again, I, I, you know, a little reflection the biohomogeneous network is clearly a, a better choice for this problem. And just to be uh, concrete, the example would be uh, speed in these uh, sesquilinear, these, these one comma one degree biohomogeneous polynomials, take the general linear combinations of those, square each of those linear combinations, feed that into the next layer, square the uh, linear combinations of those, and you know, just iterate this uh, scheme. And uh, then uh, counting parameters, the parameters are also taking matrices, so they're all quadratic in these uh, dimensions of the uh, intermediate layers, which is uh, you know really very very few parameters. You know, it's, it's basically drawing as a uh, log of the uh, degree instead of as a uh, sixth power of the degree. And uh, so, so that's a well motivated thing. But then, what is equally important and, and very nice is that it's very very close to uh, what is done in standard machine learning problems. So I, I partly motivated it that way. I formulated the approximation in terms of a neural network with a uh, given <clears throat> nonlinear term, this quadratic term, which is already something people use. It's already built into the uh, standard software. Then the other ingredients of uh, standard machine learning would be to define the problem in terms of optimizing an objective function, defining some sort of error with which the computer performs the uh, task of interest and then optimizing it in the uh, most uh, you know simple case by gradient descent just following you know descent you know, gradient lines of this uh, objective function and uh, then you know if, if, if you look at machine learning you know there are you know many modifications to this procedure there's what's called stochastic gradient descent which uh, takes uh, various uh, subsets, you know, samples from the uh, set of examples. And uh, then all this is what's implemented in the uh, standard packages. You know, we used uh, TensorFlow and uh, Keras. Okay, and so in the case of uh, machine learning, of course, you would be summing over examples. You know, X might be an image. Uh, y might be some vector that represents the uh, label as a dimension for each possible classification. And uh, the effect, the interpretation, it would be that whichever of these components of the vector is largest, we're going to assign the label to uh, that class. But in any case, the goal is to find a function that uh, well approximates that given labeling and then you could define some sort of measure of the uh, error of this type and then the uh, sum here would be over the uh, many uh, perhaps millions of images in your database so uh, what's the analogy in our case well the analogy becomes complete if we evaluate the uh, loss function recall the kind of loss function we're going to be interested in was this uh, you know integral say you know norm of eta minus one you know so eta is something which depends on the uh, Taylor potential and thus on the parameters one we could say is the uh, target the number the, the function we're trying to fit is the constant function one now how do we evaluate this uh, norm defined as you know in terms of an integral over the manifold well we could easily approximate that norm by taking the uh, you know, sampling of uh, points in the manifold and just estimating as the uh, mean over these uh, points. So what in physics or you know, more generally, you know, Monte Carlo evaluation. And uh, so with that approximation for the uh, integral involved in the norm, the analogy becomes uh, complete. We were feeding in inputs, which are these uh, biohomogeneous polynomials. We sample we take a list of uh, points in the uh, manifold and for each input point we feed in those coordinates to a network we get out some function which is the ratio of uh, the uh, Kähler form over this computable volume form and or we, we could say it you know in, in approximately one or equivalently we could say we're 
going to compute the Taylor form, the Taylor de volume form at that point numerically, and then try to uh, fit the uh, independently computed holomorphic, uh, you know, squared homo holomorphic uh, volume form. And out of all this stuff, the only non trivial code and not very hard to write is uh, you, you have to do this sampling from the start, which is not hard. And you have to compute this determinant of uh, two derivatives of the Kähler potential, which is certainly not a standard machine learning thing, but uh, turns out to be relatively easy using what's called a back propagation, this automatic ability to uh, compute uh, derivatives of uh, numerical functions. So here's an example of a uh, code for the uh, two layer network in this uh, TensorFlow uh, Keras uh, implementation. Okay, so uh, let me say some words about uh, computational details and, and, and more mathematical questions that uh, you could ask about this. But before I do that, maybe I should uh, stop and ask if there are questions because that 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 was the basic uh, the basic result is to implement and test the uh, scheme I just described. No? Okay, I will uh, continue. So, uh, okay, so let's see. So these are some implementation details which are, are spelled out in our paper. And, uh, you know, again, useful if uh, you get into this stuff. So the usual machine learning is not limited by numerical accuracy. And eventually, you know, in our, in our problem, we're limited by numerical accuracy. And so then it's, it's good to have better optimization methods to hand. And I think it's this approximate second order message method, which is called LBFGS, which I won't go into, but is pretty standard in uh, this type of numerical work. And uh, it's there in a enhanced you know, package you can add to a TensorFlow. Uh, there's the question of whether gradient descent converges on a global minimum. And then this is related to this, this question I mentioned of uh, you know, is the energy function that we're using actually convex in the uh, finite problem? And in, 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 in general, the, the answer is, uh, is, 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 is no, both you know, on general grounds and empirically, and it's very easy to write down uh, simple you know, networks. In fact, a lot of, you know, at least you know, exploratory work you can do with this example of still a linear function, but defined not in terms of a single matrix defining a linear map, but as a composition of two linear maps, W1, W2, and uh, if you put that into a loss function, which would have you know, been convex, it typically is uh, not strictly convex because of the redundancy of these uh, parameters. And uh, then there's also this question of uh, comparing the number of parameters with the number of uh, data points in a machine learning problem or the number of points that we've uh, sampled in the, uh, you know, from the manifold in our application. And you know, again, a very general feature of uh, this type of machine learning is that you have many more parameters than uh, data points. And so you're not going to have, you know, it's, it's a no post you know, there, there cannot be a unique minimum in, in that case. And so uh, again, it's not strictly convex. Okay, so those are reasons why, you know, having the implementation, you still need to uh, test it, even to know that it when you, if and when it works. And then of course, the question of how do you adjust the choices that you're making, such as the uh, layer and the uh, dimensions, the widths of these uh, networks. And uh, so we did that rather systematically with uh, a uh, three families of these uh, quintic hypersurfaces with uh, less and then uh, no symmetry. This is sort of a randomly chosen family where we have the parameter psi, the same as the dwarf uh, quintic, and another perturbation uh, alpha. And uh, then we just scan through metrics of that sort and uh, we're able to uh, you know, optimize quite a few of these uh, choices involved in the, uh, you know, the, in the software and the computations. This is an example of how the uh, network, how the error drops as you follow steps in the gradient descent. And then this, this type of stepwise, you know, approximate steps is very, very common 
in, in machine learning is basically a clue that there are some large eigenvalues of the Hessian of the objective function that you're optimizing first. And that's what you know the, these kind of uh, stages are. And eventually you uh, get to some family where you, you, you've optimized some finite number of the uh, dimensions and then uh, you, you have to switch to a uh, smaller eigenvalue and you know eventually you, you optimize that direction eventually of course you you might plateau out you might start to see a loss which is decreasing very slowly and so this is the kind of uh, data you would look at then to guide the uh, choice of these parameters okay so so in my uh, general discussion i pointed out uh, the importance of uh, symmetry and the importance of structure on small scales, which in this case was coming from adjusting the moduli to come close to a, a singularity, you know, an actual singular you know, company, hypersurface. And uh, so those are really the uh, relevant independent variables to study the uh, accuracy on which the accuracy of the uh, method depends. And uh, so uh, the uh, computation of you know, what was actually supposed to be the shortest length scale is a pretty non-trivial thing if, if you looked into uh, you know, the Hodge theory and you know, Clavier moduli spaces. But there's a, a kind of a nice approximation, which uh, we showed uh, worked well in our case, which is essentially, I mean, this, is, this was taken out of actually a <clears throat> different uh, Real com complexity theory uh, use of this, you know, study of this question of uh, singularity of uh, you know of, of such a uh, equation. That was the uh, you know you look at the uh, discriminant of, of this uh, set of equations, and uh, you know intuitively it's to say that uh, where is there you know when is the hypersurface uh, singular? It's when there's a coincidence between the manifold, the vanishing locus of F and the uh, vanishing locus of the uh, gradient. And uh, so if you think of these as functions on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the affine co you know, coefficient space. So as I, you know, we, we wrote down the general, you know, quintic, and it depends on 126 parameters. So we'll just regard that as the linear space C126, and then we can regard these sets of equations defining two linear subspaces of uh, C126. And so rather than uh, try to do the nonlinear computation of the uh, period of a three cycle or something else, we're just going to do the uh, linear computation of how close are these subspaces to each other in a uh, Fugitive Studi metric on that space. And then that boils down to, to, to this expression. We're going to try to minimize the uh, <clears throat> norm of the gradient evaluated at a particular point Z on the manifold, you know, over the choice of that Z on the manifold. So it's kind of an intuitive expression. It's clearly zero when these things coincide, but it has the uh, conceptual justification that it computes that distance that I've just uh, described. So this is for the uh, dwarf quintic, where we, you know, you can show that uh, in, in this parameterization, you know, there's, there's one singular point, this uh, so-called conifold point, where you get an ordinary double point singularity. And uh, then this is this uh, proxy for distance that I defined on the previous uh, slide. And you see that there's a, a second minimum. And it's basically you know, intuitively, you know, the, the modulized space is this uh, three puncture sphere. And then this is the other side of the sphere from this uh, conifold uh, puncture. And so this is where you've gotten closest to the conifold coming up the other side. And uh, now these are mapping this out for our uh, two parameter families where uh, the uh, heat map here is, is reddish if you're far from the singularity and uh, bluish as you get closer to the singularity. And then that's gonna be our proxy for the uh, distance to the singularity and thus the uh, smallest uh, length scale on the manifold, which as it, as it gets smaller and smaller, it should be harder to accurately describe the metric. And uh, then the uh, second uh, group here is supposed to be more complex. It only has less discrete symmetry than the, the first one. And uh, then this is examples of uh, results. This is, you know, you know, again, a lot of uh, data put on one plot, but what we've done is we've, we've collapsed 
various, you know, the complex moduli into this uh, measure of how close we are to the uh, singularity on the, uh, on the x-axis. And then this is the uh, log of the uh, error on the uh, y-axis. And then these colors are to say that, uh, for example, the uh, top guys here, these uh, you know, reddish, uh, brownish, uh, light, light blue guys are the full basis of uh, polynomials in you know, a given embedding of that, of that degree. Uh, the uh, dots in the middle here are networks of depth uh, three, uh, you know, I guess uh, two, three, and four. And then these pink guys are an estimate of if you did the calculation with the full basis of uh, polynomials of uh, degree A, what you would get. And that comes from basically a pro you know, assuming that the error goes as a simple uh, exponential in the degree and then fitting from these uh, previous explicit calculations. And, and, and basically what one can see from this is that uh, the degree A to uh, polynomials produced by this uh, you know, depth four network do just as good a job as the uh, degree eight, the full degree eight basis of polynomials. But then of course you can ask uh, what these other numbers, 50, 70, 300 are, are what are the uh, dimensions of the internal spaces, the you know, so-called the number of hidden units. And of course, for once these numbers get big enough, you'll have just as many coefficients of the neural network as you would have had to describe the, the, the general biohomogeneous polynomial. So we'll, we'll get to that comparison momentarily. And then this is a similar thing for the uh, more complicated Calabria with uh, no symmetry. And, and, and here there's actually kind of more structure. You can see that, uh, again, this uh, four layer network pretty consistently does as good a job as the uh, polynomial of the same degree. And then the there's another four layer network, but with uh, with 70, so many fewer parameters than this, this last network. And you can see that for a uh, sufficiently far from, you know, if you're sufficiently far from the singularity, so you don't have this uh, small scale in the problem, that one also does just as well. But as you get closer to the singularity and have to describe the metric on this uh, small cycle, they, they consistently don't do as well. So, so there is some sign that this, this model has enough parameters to represent a particular amount of uh, structure in the metric, but not enough to represent this uh, further addition of structure from having a smaller cycle. So that's the kind of uh, data one can you know, take from, you know, the, the conclusion that you can take from uh, those series of uh, computations and these plots. And uh, then if you actually count the uh, parameters, in, indeed, this uh, 300, this guy that was consistently doing as well as the general onsatz has almost as many parameters as the general onsatz. And this one that uh, did not do, you know, did do well on the, as you were, when you were away from the singularity, didn't do as well when you were closer to the singularity. That's one with uh, significantly fewer parameters. And uh, so the, it, it, it is a structure that one can, you know, understand in that way. And I, I think there is an interesting problem of trying to uh, produce some simple, you know, estimates for this, this accuracy in terms of the uh, parameters, the width and so forth of the uh, network, and then trying to explain that uh, mathematically. So it's not something, I mean, something that the problem that we started to formulate, but I think it's an interesting <clears throat> You know, the problem in the interface, you know, you know, the mathematics of machine learning. And uh, one reason why that kind of problem is interesting is that this, this whole question of uh, what, I'm, I'm going to say this again in the conclusions, and it's a little oversimplified, but it's, it's very widely agreed that if you have a very, very high dimensional space, you know, like the millions of dimensions of images or quantum mechanics and so forth, then the neural network is a big win in the same way. And even one can argue in some directly analogous way that uh, Monte Carlo evaluation of an integral has an error which is not controlled by the uh, dimension of the space you're integrating over. It's controlled by the number of samples and the variance of the integrand. And so you've, in that sense, completely defeated the curse of uh, dimension. And uh, so you might have optimistically said the, uh, the, the, the same thing for the neural network. 
but and 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 that's that's widely you know accepted for very high dimension but in this sort of intermediate regime like the six dimensions we're working with you know is it really true or do you need as many parameters to model the structure of the uh, things you're talking about as you, you know, as the, as the general, I'm not, not, not assuming this type of, you know, neural network or other uh, decomposition. And I think the jury is out there and it's a question of you know, very, very general interest. Okay, so let me, because uh, I think I'm uh, running out of time. Uh, this is some uh, work in progress. This is some very rudimentary, uh, you know, mathematical discussion of the, uh, question that I just described. So to try to uh, formulate it. So the kind of question you can ask is, you know, how, how do we take the questions I was just describing and, and, and make them more precise? Well, we have this general result that we're trying to approximate a smooth function. And the error is basically exponentially small in the uh, degree because of you know the, the, the smoothness, but then you still need a high power of the uh, degree. And uh, can you achieve the same kind of uh, thing, say, with, uh, if, if you could do it with a family of these neural networks with bounded width, you would be finding a, uh, instead of a, basically a, a power of a log, right? So, so the error, you know, the, uh, you know the, the log of the error is going as this power to a degree. And uh, now we're saying that uh, the neural network doesn't have number of coefficients, which is the power of a degree, but power of a log of the uh, degree. And so this starts to be you know, a, a big enough difference that you can start to use very general methods, such as computational complexity theory to try to distinguish uh, those cases. And uh, again, my, uh, this was uh, the, the second reference I gave in the introduction. My musings about this problem suggest to me that uh, you, you can't do it. You know, if, if you have a fixed width, uh, and fixed depth uh, neural network, there will always be smooth functions that you can't well approximate with uh, that number of uh, coefficients. But uh, I, you know, there's certainly no proof, and it would be interesting to look at that precise question. So this is the, uh, again, comments to, to that effect. And then, of course, for the specific problem we're talking about, you might entertain the hypothesis that the Ritchie flat metric corresponds to a uh, Kähler potential, which is not a general. We know it's smooth, but it's, of course, not the general smooth function. It might have more structure, which makes it easier to approximate. But, uh, you know, again, at least in the numerical results that, that we got, I, I, think, I, I think don't support that uh, conjecture either. So, uh, okay, so, so this is another type of issue that uh, has been studied quite a lot in machine learning. Let me let me not belabor it or not, but a lot. But it's this question of uh, the overparameterized regime. If you have many more parameters than uh, data points, then since the problem would seem very uh, ill-posed, you know, how is it that you're finding a, a good solution that, uh, in the case of uh, machine learning, can uh, generalize? So this is a very very much studied question in theory of uh, machine learning and. Uh, you know, again, there's some some analogy here. I mean, we uh, do need, uh, you know, again, in, in many of our calculations, we did use uh, more parameters than sample points on our manifold. And we also found that uh, the results were still good and didn't suffer from this type of, uh, you know, you know, you know the, the, the opposedness of the problem. And so there's points of contact with theory of machine learning there. Uh, I think I've about run out of time. This is in my second paper. This is an alternate approach that one could try to follow uh, numerically in terms of uh, tensor networks to approximate these metrics. It would be interesting to explore that. There are, this has been studied, for example, in the Laura Ford's et al. and some of the other references that I described. You can fairly easily adapt this to uh, finding Hermitian Yang Mills metrics on the uh, manifold. So uh, let me uh, let me summarize, and uh, if there's time, uh, take uh, questions. And uh, so, it's, uh, as I say, it, it really is a, a useful method. Uh, there's quite a few interesting mathematical questions that that our that our work raises. We'll be having a, a workshop on this in uh, November at the uh, Simon Center in uh, Stony Brook, which you can see on uh, the Simon Center website and. Uh, 
you know, apply to if you're interested in this. So uh, thanks for your attention and uh, thanks again.